I guess it's always interesting to look at the behavior of humans through the prism of how other animals behave. And there are some really good reasons to assume that the behavior of humans and other species might actually be governed by some of the same underlying rules. So the idea that I want to explore in this talk is that by watching other animals behave, we might be able to learn something about ourselves. And the behavior that I'm most interested in, the type of behavior I'm most interested in, is aggressive behavior that animals use when they fight. And it's actually really tempting sometimes to think that we might be able to reduce aggression in humans by watching what other animals do and kind of trying to model our behavior on theirs, trying to be a little bit more like other animals. Because right across the animal kingdom, we see loads and loads of examples of what we call pro-social behavior. This is behavior where one individual goes out of its way to try and help another individual, to try and improve its well-being. Here are a couple of examples. Um, you can see uh, on, the left, on your left-hand side, there's a picture of some ants. And I don't know if you can make it out, but one of the ants, the, ants with, the ant with the red mark on its abdomen, has been pinned onto the floor with a little bit of plastic. And the, green, the ant with the green mark, it, its nest mate, is doing its best to free it from that trap. And here are a couple of capuchin monkeys, and they seem to be quite peacefully and calmly sharing some food with each other. And some people have suggested that this type of pro-social behavior might be underpinned by a sense of empathy that some animals have for one another. It's even been suggested that some animals might have a sense of morality. But morality and empathy, if they do exist in other animals, certainly aren't enough to prevent aggression. And the problem is that all animals rely on resources. And in nature, very often, there aren't enough resources to go around. And when animals are in that situation, the pro-social behavior can go out of the window, and they'll frequently start to use aggressive behavior so that individuals try to take those limited resources for themselves. So here's another picture of ants. This time, you'll notice that one of the ants has trapped the antenna of another ant in its mandibles, the, 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 the tooth-like mouth parts that it uses. And, and here it's using its mandibles as a weapon in a dispute over the ownership of territory between two nests. And even those cute little capuchins can become aggressive when times are hard. When there isn't enough food to go around, they'll use aggression to try and secure that food for themselves. So I don't think we can really solve the problem of aggression in people by trying to model ourselves and other animals. But can we at least learn something about the nature of aggression by watching other animals fight? And I've spent around 20 years, over 20 years, watching animals fight each other, um, mainly these two species, the common European hermit crab and the beadlet sea anemone. These are actually animals that are very common around our rocky shores in the UK. So you can see these, these creatures for yourself anytime you go down to the beach and have a bit of a rummage around in some rock pools. Fighting isn't necessarily what you think it might be. In, a, in, every, in every instance. So what I want to do is show you a couple of movies to kind of illustrate the range of different things that we can describe as aggressive behavior. So let's have a look at hermit crabs first. Okay, so hermit crabs live in empty snail shells, and they need one that's big enough to hide in when they're threatened. One of these crabs is in a shell that's too small, and it wants that bigger shell, which the other crab has. So it's ran in and grabs it, and it's going to use some aggressive behavior, which you'll see and hear in a moment, to try and take that big shell off the other crab. Don't worry about the blue flashes. We don't strap lasers to the crabs. That's just the autofocus on our camera. This is called shell wrapping. So the crab in the shell that's too small is kind of bashing its shell repeatedly against the shell of, of the defending crab. 
and it does it in a series of bouts which are separated by pauses. And if it does it hard enough and fast enough and leaves short enough pauses between the bouts, it should be able to convince the crab in the bigger shell to give up. It's just been evicted from that shell, and the crab that won the fight, the attacker, has now taken over that shell, leaving the original crab in the big shell just the crummy little shell to have. So there was a decision to give up there. The crab in the big shell decided to stop fighting and allow itself to be evicted. It reached this decision without any injuries, okay? So there were no injuries involved in this fight. But of course, some fights do involve injuries. And what you're going to see now is a fight in sea anemones. You can see the feeding tentacles in the larger anemone. But look at those blue tentacles. These are special tentacles that they only use to fight other anemones with. When they swipe each other with the tentacles, they're actually injecting toxins into the skin of the other anemone. If, if you hope to see this on the shore, um, you'll have to be very patient because it happens very slowly. This film sped up 64 times to make it look more dynamic. But what you could see clearly, as well as the anemones trying to injure each other, is again, one of these anemones made a decision it, that the small guy ran away, relinquishing that space on the rock that they were fighting over. So this is a very important feature of what we want to understand about animal aggression. It's obvious why animals would start fighting so that they can claim ownership of a limited resource that they need. But how do animals decide to stop fighting? When do they know how to give up? And there are really two ways that you could decide to give up in a fight. Let's assume that being in a fight is costly. OK, now those costs could come from a variety of sources. In the hermit crabs, the costs could come from continuously smashing your shell against the other crab's shell. Perhaps receiving those wraps uh, is detrimental as well, and you've got to use energy to resist kind of being shaken out of your shell. So the costs come from the energy that you're putting into the fight. In the sea anemones, the costs come from the injuries that, that you receive, from the toxins that have been injected into your skin. So if fighting is costly, it makes sense that the longer the fight goes on, the greater cost you pay. This is what this blue line means. Uh, a longer fight, the costs increase, costs increase with time. So one really easy way to decide to stop fighting is that you have a threshold, my own individual threshold, which represents the maximum cost that I'm able to pay. Once I've hit this threshold, you can kind of think of it as becoming exhausted. I either can't fight anymore or I can't fight effectively, so this is when I decide to cut my losses and run. So I'm going to call this giving up based on cost. It's a really simple way to decide to stop fighting, but it's actually not a very smart way. It's a bit dumb because what if your rival, what if your opponent's threshold is higher than yours? In this case, even if you fight all the way up to your own threshold, you're never going to win the fight because your opponent will be able to hang on for a little bit longer. So a smarter way to decide to give up fighting is to try and sort of suss out where your opponent's threshold is we can think of that as sussing out how strong or good at fighting your opponent is. And as soon as you know you're the weaker individual, give up then, because you won't be able to win the fight anyway. If you give up sooner, you can avoid paying all that cost that you would have paid by hitting your own threshold. So the neat thing about these two different models we have for giving up, giving up based on cost, and, and what I'm going to call giving up based on information, information about where your opponent's threshold might be, is they make a set of different predictions, and we can actually distinguish between them using data and, and figure out how animals know when to stop fighting. So let's have a look at giving up based on cost first. So these predictions are to do with how long the fight lasts for, the, the duration of the fight, 
and how that relates to the strength of the loser and the strength of the winner. And if giving up is based on cost, then fight should last longer as losers become stronger, because stronger losers will have higher thresholds. These are the guys that decide to end the contest by running away, but the stronger they are, the longer they will hold on before ending the contest. We might also see that contests last longer as winners become stronger as well. And the reason for this is that in nature, all out fighting is much more likely when those opponents are sort of fairly evenly matched in their ability. So giving up on costs, we should see longer fights, um, certainly when losers become stronger, and perhaps when winners are stronger as well. What about giving up based on information, based on knowing that you're weaker than your opponent? Well, here we see a slightly different pattern. We still see that fights are longer when losers are stronger. And the reason for this is that as losers become stronger, they become closer in ability to their rival. And this makes it harder for them to know that they're the weaker opponent. In terms of the winner's strength, we should see the opposite pattern for the same sort of reason. As winners become stronger, fights should be shorter. And this is because if you're fighting another individual who's much stronger than you, it becomes obvious earlier on that you're the weaker individual. So we've got two different patterns that we should see in our data, as long as we've got data on the strength of the loser and the strength of the winner and how long the fight lasts for, we should be able to work out how the actual loser decides to, to give up and stop fighting and, and relinquish their claim for that valuable resource that, that both parties want. So what do animals actually do, non-human animals? Well, well, biology and, and I, I guess I would argue especially Animal behavior is a complicated science. Um, no matter how carefully you design your experiments, there are probably all sorts of things going on within your experiment that you don't really know about. So it's sometimes difficult to get very clear cut patterns that perfectly match our model, like, like either of these two models. But what we see in the main when we look across the animal kingdom at all the examples of fighting hermit crabs and sea anemones, but lots of other species as well uh, that many people have worked on, is that in the main, we see a pattern that matches the top set of predictions rather than the bottom one. In other words, animals tend to give up in a fight in the dumb way by fighting until they become completely exhausted. Now, most of the time, when we test these predictions, we do it in fights that involve one individual against another individual, just two animals engaging in a fight together. But of course, fighting sometimes takes place not just between two individuals, but between groups of individuals. Going back to those ants, so here they are using again their mandibles as weapons to try and damage each other. These battles actually take place between rival colonies, and they can involve thousands of individuals uh, fighting over contested territory that both colonies want. And of course, another species that engages in battles or, or fights between groups are humans, us. And if these fights between groups become big enough, we call them wars. So given Given the huge cost of warfare, especially modern industrialized warfare, and the huge costs that must be involved if countries actually stay in the war until they're so exhausted and their resources and, and their manpower are so depleted that they can't continue fighting, I was interested to see whether I could apply this framework to warfare and find out whether in wars the losing country just keeps going until they can't fight anymore, or do they give up in that smarter way, cutting their losses when they know they can't possibly win. And there are data 
on um, how long wars have lasted for. This is a publicly available data set called the Correlates of War data set. And it covers the early 1800s uh, right up to the first Gulf War. So it includes the Crimean War, um, World War II, which is the first and only war so far to involve nuclear weapons, uh, up to the first Gulf War in 2003. So we have duration on the uh, uh, data on the duration of these wars, how long they lasted for. There's another data set that tells us how strong these countries were in terms of their military strength at the time of these wars. So we've got data on duration, we've got data on the strength of the winner and the strength of the loser. So we've got everything we need if we put those data together to ask how is the decision to end a war actually made. Let's just remind ourselves of the predictions again. So if war proceeds until one side becomes completely exhausted and just can't fight anymore and has paid a huge cost uh, by, by, by fighting right up to the, their own threshold of what they can pay, we should see the top pattern when we uh, look at the relation between the losing side strength and how long the war lasted and the winner's side strength and how long the war lasted, that the duration of the war should increase with the strength of both. But if the losing side makes the decision in a smarter way, avoiding reaching that threshold and paying, pay, paying such a high cost, we should see the bottom pattern, where the duration increases with the loser's strength, but decreases with the winner's strength. So let's have a look at the data from the Correlates of War data set. Okay. So you can see that wars last longer as losers become stronger, and wars last longer also as winners become stronger. This is from 44 wars between 1823 and 2003. This indicates that when the losing side decides to quit in a war, they've done so not at the point when they realize they can't win, but they've kept going on to the bitter end uh, where they just cannot fight anymore. So, this is what we see when we analyze human warfare using an approach that we took from watching and understanding how animals use aggression, how other animals use aggression. So what can animals tell us about war? I think the message from this is that it might be easy to start a war, but getting out of one is going to be protracted and costly. And I want to finish up with a couple of quotes about warfare, because obviously war is something that affects most human societies at some time, and it's something that people have thought about for a long, a long time. So I've got a couple of quotes here from Sun Tzu. Uh, Writing in China two and a half thousand years ago, Sun Tzu was a general, a warlord, and also somewhat of a philosopher of war. He said a lot of things about warfare, but these two things seem, seem very apt to, to what I've just described. So his first quote I want to share with you is, opponents cannot exhaust you. The implication here is that you can only exhaust yourself. It seems to fit with the idea of losing sides fighting up to the maximum cost they can possibly bear. Something else interesting, he said, was that if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the results of a thousand battles. This, to me, seems to match the idea that countries engaged in war should try and suss out their strength relative to their opponent. They may do this, but I don't think it helps them decide whether to end a war. And you know, it's difficult to know whether you've really come up with something new. I suspect most of what I've told you will not be a surprise to people who are involved in organizing wars and prosecuting wars and managing them. But I think it's something that, if more people appreciated it, perhaps those wars would be less likely to start in the first place, and people would be less willing to get sucked into them. Thank you.